Good afternoon. Welcome to Berkeley. It's nice to have you all here. Um, my name is Sarah Beckman, and this is Bjorn Hartman. And we are the two people at present tasked with um, figuring out what's going to happen in the new um, Jacobs Institute of Design Innovation uh, and what the curriculum will look like here at Berkeley around design and innovation. Um, and before we jump into what is going to happen here, I thought it would be helpful to give you a little bit of the why. Uh, we are particularly engaged in bringing design and innovation to you as undergraduate students in engineering at Berkeley. Um, so, any of you know the story of how the game of chess was designed? Anybody know the legend of it? So, the story goes like this, that there was a guy named Sessa, and he was asked to design the game of chess for some king. And he designed the game, and the king said, that's a great game. What would you like uh, as a reward for having designed that game of chess? And he said, I would like rice on my chessboard. One grain on the first square, two on the second, four on the third. And the king, sort of extrapolating to the end of the first row of the chessboard, where there's a little pile of 128 grains of rice, said, no problem. Um, and, uh, and it wasn't until he'd sent his people off to figure out what this uh, implied with multiple abacuses or abacai, whatever the plural is, not, that the size of the pile of rice on the farthest most square of the chessboard was the size of Mount Everest. So that's what exponential looks like, right? You guys know what exponential curves look like? So anybody know what Moore's Law is? We have prospective engineers here. What's, what's the, prospect, you're not a prospective, are you? It's a, <laughs> so you're looking. So what is Moore's Law? Uh, the cost of computing power will go down by a factor of two uh, every so often. Every so often. Something like every 18 months to, to, to a year, two years, right? So what that says is from a technological point of view, with that technology, with storage technologies, with all kinds of different technologies, we are today about halfway across that chessboard in a totally manageable field of rice. But Mount Everest is getting closer and closer. We're about to take off on an ex exponential growth curve in technology in all kinds of different dimensions that has implications for us and how we engage in using, designing, um, applying those technologies in the, in the world. And so if you begin to think about that, you could look at the future with fear, like Intel sits there and goes, whoa, is the PC dead? Um, what are we going to do next? Or we might stand here, Bjorn and I, and say, is Sage on the Sage teaching a thing of the past? What's going to happen to education? So there's all kinds of things you could say are scary about it, or you could look at that future as if it holds opportunity in it. Um, so you could say, whoa, look at those, who's seen Google cars driving down the freeway and, uh, right? So this is going to totally change the transportation industry. We know that the education industry is totally going to be changed. Healthcare, you know, they've already said that the, there's somebody alive today, you've seen those signs, somebody's alive today who will live to be 150. Well, they're also predicting that within two decades, we will enable people to live to be 1,000 years old. Think about that. So these are the kinds of things, when you come here to school, you're coming here to work on those kinds of futures, being able to build those technologies out, but with people in mind, with people at the center of doing that. And so we've been very fortunate here at Berkeley, through Paul Jacobs um, and Stacy Jacobs' generosity, to be able to create a new institute of design and, and innovation. And Paul and, and Dean Sastry announced this at the Clinton Global Initiative, that what we really want to give you today when you come here as students is something beyond technical skills. Technical skills are important, but in that world where technology is changing at the rate that it's changing, where entire industries are going to be turned on, on their heads, we need to be able to have um, students who can also work in interdisciplinary teams, that can integrate arts and engineering, arts and technology, can go through these rapid iterative design cycles, can put humans at the center of the design process. 
So that's what we are engaged in trying to bring you here. So we are creating um, right now a new minor in design and innovation. And in that minor, you will have the opportunity to uh, do things like learn the design process, learn the elements of the design process that allow you to tackle what we sometimes call wicked problems. Anybody know the term wicked problems? It was actually coined by a professor over in the College of Environmental Design named Horst Riddle uh, some number of years ago. Um, they're problems that have no stopping rule, have no one right answer, um, they, that you have to experiment in order to get to um, various different uh, ways of understanding the solutions. They're volat they they, they uh, include volatility, ambiguity, complexity, um, and uncertainty. Um, so you'll be able to tackle those wicked problems. This is an example of a class where they're trying to figure out how to design waterless uh, toilets. And so they, they actually built prototypes um, that showed how you would use the toilets. They also uh, modeled the entire process of what would happen to the waste, where it would go, all of that kind of thing. These are wicked problems in the world of how you would make that work in various different environments. Um, we'll, the minor will have classes that allow you to understand and define unmet user needs in the world around you. So this is a class in bioengineering where they go out into clinical settings and they actually work with doctors and nurses and patients to understand what their needs are and what they might be able to do or change in order to make um, the lives better of the people in those settings. Um, there will be opportunities to work on, um, collaborate with students from across the campus. And so um, this is an example of, um, of a robot. Um, I think it won the prize for the third fast ro fastest robot in the uh, world. Um, and it is based on not just mechanical engineering design um, or on electrical engineering design, but on um, biology. Uh, so there's a professor here who studies cockroaches, has a little treadmill for cockroaches. Um, he's learned all kinds of interesting things about how cockroaches run and work. And so he, the, together, the students from those various disciplines put together this robot that is the third fastest in the world. So those are the kinds of things that we're trying to accomplish with the uh, minor in design and innovation. Bjorn is going to take you through, sorry, the one last piece of that is that we also are building space, and that's the important part of this new building, in which to do that kind of work. Um, and you'll get to see some of the precursor spaces to that today, um, including the Invention Lab. Um, the objective of these spaces is that they have courses in them in which not only do you work on t in teams with um, students from other disciplines across the um, uh, the university, but that you also can actually make things while you're in the space. So you're not just learning about the theory, but you're actually um, building things as well. So Bjorn is going to take you through some of the what, the specific classes that um, exist as a part of the uh, minor. Great. Thanks, Sarah. So um, I'm an assistant <coughs> professor in computer science, and I teach a course here at Berkeley called Interactive Device Design. There's actually a shared course between computer science and mechanical engineering because most of the really interesting um, problems cross different disciplines. So in our course, we marry conceptual knowledge and practice. So you may learn about sensing technologies and how to build sensor and actuator circuits, and then later on that week in lab, put that knowledge into action uh, here in our soldering lab by building um, sensing circuits on, on breadboards and soldering circuit boards. Now, the main goal of this course is to teach you how to go from an idea to a fully functional prototype of a future smart product. So I've just have a, a couple of examples here of student projects. In the upper left hand, you see a internet-connected radiant thermostat that has a more accurate way of measuring how hot or cold we feel a room is rather than just measuring air temperature. Below that is a water consumption monitor that uh, sends data to your smartphone about who in your household is using how much water and it never needs to, uh, you never need to change the battery on it because it's powered by a hydro generator that's in the water pipe. And on the right hand side is a um, medical device that helps neurologists measure the patellar reflex over time to tell whether patients' reflexes are getting better or worse. Now let's just go into a little more detail what one of these projects looks like. How do you go from an idea to um, one of these final devices. So here's another uh, student project. This is 
the smart cup. This is a cup that can track what you drink and how much you drink over the course of the day. So who may want to know that information? Athletes, nursing mothers, dialysis patients, and many groups for whom it's really important to know how much you drink. So this particular cup is connected uh, to your iPhone, where it not only gives you statistics, but it can also you know, send you alarms like, no more caffeine today, or you're not going to be able to go to sleep. So how does that work? Well, clearly there's computer science in building this application, right? There's a CS aspect, but um, underneath, in the cup, the cup itself is 3D printed, mechanical engineering at work, and inside are sensors. So there are temperature sensors, LEDs, pressure sensors, and a wireless radio that send all of this information from the cup to your phone. So a marriage of mechanical engineering, electrical engineering, and computer science. Now, I'm not the only one who teaches courses in the Invention Lab, which is downstairs. Uh, my colleague Eric Paulos also teaches a class called Critical Making, which marries arts and engineering. So half the class is filled with engin engineers, and the other half is filled with arts and rhetoric and social science majors. And um, we got this wonderful quote that students really love these classes that allow them to bridge theory and practice and that bring different disciplines together. And that is really one of the hallmarks um, of a good design education. Now, if you're not on the CS side, maybe you're interested in uh, biomedical engineering. So here's uh, bioengineering Amy Hurst class. This is a pressure sensing mat that has been deployed in Guatemala, where the majority of households still have open fire stoves. And that exposes people in the household to all kinds of uh, harmful substances when those open fires are, are burning. Now, with that mat, you can sense who in the household is actually close to the stove over the course of the day. And that can inform then interventions for, for example, redesigning these stoves. Or here's another uh, project from bioengineering. Um, for our aging population. So most falls in the home happen when people do not use their walkers. For example, in a narrow hallway where there's, there are all kinds of detritus that prevents you from using the walker. So they built a walker that can change its form factor. It can either be wide or it can be really narrow to walk sideways. And this is all kind of implemented and designed over the course of a semester. Now, our we do not only have course projects. So one of the strengths of Berkeley is that we have a really wide range of co-curricular activities. So you can get involved in clubs or in design competitions or in research projects. So here's a great um, design-centric project led by um, Professor Ken Goldberg. The California Report Card is a smartphone application that lets any citizen in California grade how our state is doing, and it then aggregates this data and sends it to our politicians in Sacramento. And this is not only an academic exercise. In fact, in this very room just a couple of weeks ago, our Lieutenant Gov Governor, Gavin Newsom, was here and said, this application helps him keep his ear to the ground. There have now been more than 20,000 votes um, um, submitted on this application, and it's really having an impact. So I believe you can actually just download that at California um, report card and rate your politicians today. So all of this is happening um, and will be happening in the new Jacobs Institute for Design Innovation, which will open its doors in fall of 2015. Now, in the meantime, we're launching all of these experiments of what design education looks like, for example, downstairs here in the Invention Lab, over at the Haas School of Business, and all over campus. This is a rendering of the outside of the building. It will be just uh, across the street behind Soda and Echeverry Hall. And here are some, uh, some early renderings of what we imagine the inside will look like. So we'll have six design studios that will provide collaborative spaces and flexible teaching environments so you're not just stuck sitting in lecture mode as we are here in this auditorium. But you can learn some concepts and then put those concepts at work uh, at a workbench right away. And we'll also have access to the latest digital prototyping technologies. So what would those be? For example, 3D printing is extensively used uh, in, in my class. What can you make with 3D printers? Well, today we make enclosures, 
game controllers, or for example, here's, uh, we have our faculty member, Carlos Sacan in the audience, um, who is a world expert on mathematical sculpture. And so one of his uh, models is up there in the upper right. Um, other tools would, for example, be laser cutters that allow you to cut sheet material based on a digital input file that you can then assemble um, into 3D parts. And there are similar technologies that allow you to make circuit boards for your electronics in the matter of an hour or so. But the technology here is only half of the story. Because really, what's going to um, make this building succeed is the community of students. And we're going to focus on team-driven, project-centric courses, because that is really how you learn really deeply the fundamentals, and you learn how to work with other people who may have other strengths from yourself, who have education in different disciplines. And that happens in the courses, as well as in lots of co-curricular activities, such as the design clubs and competitions. So for example, this is a picture of this semester's Invention Fellows, where we ran an open competition and we said, give us your best idea where you need access to all of this digital fabrication equipment, and we selected 10 teams that have outstanding ideas that are independent of classwork. So there are going to be tremendous design classes, tremendous opportunity outside of classes to get involved in design, and we hope that you'll all join us here at Berkeley. And with that, we'll open it up to Q&A, and after that, we will also have student volunteers in the yellow shirts who uh, can lead you on a tour of the various design facilities we have on campus today. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. So, should we take some questions? Yeah. Hi, thank you for that presentation. So I had a quick question. Uh, so you did mention that most of these designs are interdisciplinary. Uh, and I'm wondering that uh, there might be students without the specific backgrounds required to really understand what's going on. Uh, just out of curiosity, like how, how are you going to work with like, people from different backgrounds and kind of getting them up to speed with what they need to know? So the idea is not so much that they um, would have to learn all of the engineering that goes with it, or all the business that goes with it, or all the design that goes with it, but that rather, when you bring the multiple disciplines together, they bring representation of their disciplinary knowledge to that team activity. So um, I've taught a class we call Managing the New Product Development Process here for a number of years, where we have business engineering design students. And the idea is that each of them makes a contribution from their perspective to the team while learning um, the design process as they go along. So, so they're not, they're, they don't have to understand everybody's discipline. What we're trying to do is, uh, Dave Blakely's here idea has sort of been part of coining the term T-shaped people, that we're saying you want to have depth in a discipline, but the capability of talking across disciplines in order to be able to engage in the, um, in the design process. And all those futures that I described at the beginning, if we're really going to redo the transportation industry, or we're really, really going to redo um, healthcare, um, it requires multiple disciplines to be present on the team to grapple with the different elements of that. In the back. In the state, um, so is this like a capstone project for one of the engineering schools? Is that, is that tied back to that, or is it just independent of all that? Great. So uh, you're right in that what you see, what, we, what most engineering pro programs are structured like today is that these types of design projects come as the capstone in year four. Um, what we believe, though, is essential is to actually introduce students to this mode of thinking and working in their freshman year. So the capstone courses will also be around, right? But we're going to start much earlier to expose students to uh, this mode of project-centric work. And I think the other piece of that is the capstones tend to be interdisciplinary in general. Um, and the objective here is to have these projects be multidisciplinary. But one way of doing that could be to take a capstone and, and say it's a bioengineering capstone project. You could also have, let's say, a business student helping to fill out, well, what would the business model be that would support the work that um, Bjorn told you about that some of the, the teams are doing? Um, so the capstone projects will not go away as unidisciplinary experiences, but we're trying to expand that to include um, 
Would you have any advice for someone who's in high school trying to decide um, whether to take a more of a science or more of an art design route to get move into this area? It sounds very interesting. There are many possible paths to end up here, right? Um, as Sarah said, you want to find your passion, the you know, vertical part of your T, and really invest in that. But then as early as possible, try to understand the other perspectives. So try to learn at least the language of how artists talk about aesthetics if you're an engineer, or the other way around as well, right? So everyone will probably find their one strength, the one they're really passionate about, and that's where you find your depth. But as early as possible, you can certainly do this in high school, find those project opportunities to work with people who have other strengths and come together as a team. Having just taken my son on college tours last week, so I'm right in the middle of all of this, I would say, you know, if you don't know what you want to do, these kinds of projects are a great way to figure that out um, because you can be part of a project team and say, boy, I really liked what the uh, engineers got to do on that project team. I really liked what the cognitive science students were doing on that team. I think I'll go over there and do that. But I'm also going to suggest, in a moment, we're going to have you go off with all these wonderful people in yellow shirts. Um, some of them are engineers. Some of them are cognitive science majors. Some of them are, um, I don't know if we have any architecture represented here today, but um, they come from different places, and they've all engaged here in being in the design space and working on the kinds of projects that Bjorn and I have alluded to. So I would urge you not to ask us, because for Bjorn it hasn't been very long. For me it's been a really long time since I was in that position. But they know what it's like to be thinking about, and they know what it's like to get here and say, well, I came here as an engineering major, but I think I'm going to change to be this now, because I really like this better. Um, so the, you know, the, the world is open to that exploration. My big suggestion is just take advantage of being able to explore. How does the ownership of intellectual property get shared between the students and the school? Uh, so in, there's a, I am not a lawyer, but my general understanding is <laughs> if you are a graduate student and you work on sponsored research at any university, right, the intellectual property goes to the university, just as if you work at a, at a company Usually your employment contract says the intellectual property goes to a company. That is very different from class projects. Right? Projects that you do on your own or as part of a class um, are largely yours. We have the benefit here, of, I, because I've done new product development for a long time, I've had this question many times, that the benefit at Berkeley is that the intellectual property belongs to the student. If you're the one who invents it, it belongs to you except if you are leveraging technology in a lab that you are also employed by, in which case you are an employee of the university, and the intellectual property therefore belongs um, to the university, so that's a little. But most students in our classes who design things, they own the, the, the property, and they're welcome to use it as they like, including working with companies to do things with it. Yeah, and we actually have also other opportunities. It's in our interest, right, to make you successful with your idea, and if you want to start a company, start a company with that. So there are incubator programs and other ways to give you the right mentorship to think through not just the technology, but also the business implications of how to turn your idea into a company. I just want to say one thing. I teach entrepreneurship for engineers, and our students have created a fair number of companies. So if you want, to, if your students have ideas and they want to start companies, Berkeley is a good place to go. So I think um, what we'd like to do is to let you um, talk to the experts now. Bjorn and I are happy to answer questions if you want to come up afterwards. But um, we have recruited uh, uh, some students from um, various, like I said, various different aspects of the design discipline here at Berkeley. Um, and they are available to you to take you around some of the spaces that are here on, um, on campus. But also, perhaps more importantly, if you have questions and you really want to talk to somebody who's on the ground and doing it, I strongly urge you um, to, to spend some time with them. So how would you like to have them go off? Can I just see a show of hands? Who 
who might like to join a tour? And as you can see, we have many tour guides. So I see a couple there and a few here. Oh, quite a number of you. Fabulous. That is outstanding. So Emily Rice, could you raise your hand? Hi. Uh, your woman in the picture. So Emily, how uh, did you have a thought about how you might do you want to do the matching up of tour groups? Yeah, I'm actually going to take all the students out into the hallway. Okay. It's going to be a brief tour, about 30 minutes. We'll have three great shops and some of the most popular design spaces on campus. So as you come out, um, I'm going to direct you towards students and then send you off with them as they form groups of about 15. Mm -hmm. um, so, okay. Yeah, great. 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 So if you want a tour, I'll Thank you, everyone.